uh, once again, uh, once again, I hope uh, by this time, uh, Moushumi and other two faculty members have joined. Uh, uh, Moushumi, ma'am, is there? there. Moushumi, ma'am, has joined, but Mithun uh, is also there. Mithun is also there. Yes, Mithun, oh, okay. uh, is he there? I, I cannot see him yet, sir. Okay, I'll call him personally so that okay, I'm I'm muting myself. Um, Sreri, I think it's uh, one fifty-eight. I can just two minutes uh, more. Two minutes more. Yes, all right. We'll sharply begin at two. Yes. All right. So both um, Shucharita Shin Gupta and Shamata Vishesh, they said that they will be having powerpoints, so they can share their screen. So by presenting, I guess they can share their screen. Yes, quite definitely. Uh, they can uh, present, click present now, and I'm sure they know how to present the screen. So there won't be an issue regarding that. Okay. Um, I think uh, Dr. Shamuta Bishash has sent the uh, send me a mail also as well. Let me check. Yes, I have. Just in case my computer malfunctions, then I will request you to kindly present it for me. Thank you, ma'am. I have received it. I will do the need for Great. It. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to check, like, uh, what is the time allocation? Just I was just moving out and coming back. Can we uh, just cross check uh, how many minutes we have for each and for this session? So we will begin just right now. And after a small introduction, it, I will hand over to you. OK. And uh, how many minutes I may, I may uh, Dr. Shamilandu was telling me also to not give only moderator's remarks, slightly uh, make a little elaborate one. Yes, sir. Uh, how many minutes I have? 15 to 20 minutes. 15 to 20 minutes for me. And for each presenter, uh, sir? 30 minutes. 30 minutes each, right. Very good. Fair enough. Uh, all right. Uh, Sreyadi, I think uh, I'll just uh, start and hand over to you. Yeah, sure. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are starting the afternoon session of the one day workshop on forced migration humanity at the crossroads. Uh, we have with us a um, very experienced and very uh, well known number of uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, the session will be uh, conducted and carried out by Ms. Rhea Chatterjee, lecturer in political science, Shivna Shastri College. And I will hand over to her so she can introduce the uh, moderator, the particip uh, the speakers, and carry on the session. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome our esteemed speakers and all the participants. Before we proceed on with our session, I want to give a gentle reminder to all the participants that please do not post any questions or greetings in the chat box while the speakers are presenting. All the questions will be answered during the question answer session. The modality of asking the questions remains the same as has been followed in the first session. In this session, we begin with Ms. Shucharita Shengupto, followed by Dr. Shamuta Vishash. The session ends with a short film, Calcutta, a migrant city. The entire session will be moderated by Dr. K. M. Parivelan. Dr. K. M. Parivelan serves as a chairperson and associate professor at Nodal Center of Excellence for Human Rights, Education, and Center for Statelessness and Refugee Studies, School of Law, Rights, and Constitutional Governance, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Previously, he had served at United Nations Development Program for facilitating the post-tsunami recovery and at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and facilitated the voluntary repatriation of Sri Lankan refugees as part of peace process. He also briefly served at Pondicherry University and Jamia Mila Central University, respectively. He is a visiting faculty to South Asian Orientation Program on forced migration covering issues such as refugee rights and protection regime, IDPs, environment and resource politics, etc. Jointly organized by Mohanirban Calcutta Research Group. Sir has already joined us. Sir, over to you. 
thank you very much at the outset uh, my sincere appreciations and my gratitude to the organizers uh, the shivnath sastri college team and the mahanirban calcutta research group especially professor samir das uh, who contacted me and requested me to be part of this and also to dr shamilandu uh, machumdar who was facilitating me to join uh, i was there since the morning and uh, it was quite interesting uh, you know uh, to hear the uh, speakers uh, who are all well known and uh, uh, you know it was uh, contextualized that we have a covid pandemic as a context and then uh, largely uh, migrant laborers domestic workers uh, you know uh, the uh, manual scavengers uh, and uh, and all these related issues were very well covered uh what we will be doing is this afternoon we will try to broad base it a little bit uh, when we are keeping the theme uh post migration and humanity at crossroads definitely it needs to uh, look at uh, other marginalized and vulnerable groups such as uh, refugees uh internally displaced persons uh it should include asylum seekers should definitely include also another category very important called the stateless people uh it was referred i think a little bit by much about uh, the uh, nrc and the caa issue um i think uh, this all broadly constitutes uh, you know forced uh, migration uh, uh, as a as a situation as a scenario uh, we all know that and when we look at the uh, unhcr uh, database uh, regarding the current uh, scenario of forced migration uh it quotes a whooping number of nearly about uh, you know 80 million people nearly uh, been affected displaced uh, which is a very very uh, you know uh, a matter of concern uh, globally uh, we know that the global politics uh, regional geopolitics ethnicity religion human rights violation as it was mentioned uh, in the inaugural note in the morning are all the root causes of forced migration here we are uh, uh, we should be very clear about distinguishing uh, the uh, uh you know the general migration and forced migration we have to keep forced migration as a context obviously we uh, we know the nature of uh, involuntariness the nature of uh, being forced out of one's place or even to return uh, there are concerns now in the pandemic that whether one can do the reverse migration so these have to be uh, kept in mind the, the specific circumstances in which each nation state undergoes or the region undergoes and within the country different parts uh, have been forced migration broad, broadly encompasses the involuntary displacement caused by uh, conflicts of a uh, variety of nature uh, natural uh, disasters as it was mentioned in the morning as well uh, development induced and it could also be a, you know economic migration which can put an enormous pressure on, uh, on on that and and change its nature as we are witnessing now during the uh, current uh, covid pandemic so these all have to be covered we will be also touching about refugees asylum seekers stateless idps uh, in a way i'd like to uh, broadly put into our three frameworks in which i would like to uh, uh, you know give this inaugural i mean initial uh, remarks and then move on to the speakers we have two speakers waiting we have to look at uh, uh, what kind of gaps in laws are there uh, the gaps between the international refugee protection uh, international uh, stateless protection and uh, and and what do we have uh, in the national laws so i think the gap between that and the gap between whatever policies ad hoc uh, level we have how that is actually uh, linked with the gaps to the practice and, uh, and 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 piecemeal approach we have is a matter of concern number one so having a legal vacuum we have deserve the refugee protection and triggering new groups who are going to become stateless uh through the context of nrccia as uh, just before the uh, covid uh, pandemic uh, we all know how the entire nation was uh, uh, responding uh, to that uh, huge challenge and now the current crisis itself covid uh, itself has uh, you know uh, exposed a very unprecedented challenge in front of us for all kinds of people citizens laborers refugees and and so on and so forth enormously so we are able to see how the internal migrants who are displaced their plight which is mirrored or reflected the way we had seen the external migrants such as refugees and vice versa so this is actually i'm trying to invoke the words of professor ranabir shamadar uh, the distinguished uh, uh, you know um, uh, fellow of uh, the 
Mahanirman Kalkata Research Group himself was recently uh, mentioning this, that we are able to see the mirror of each uh, in a way. So I think that is something I would like to contextualize, having seen entirely a focus on uh, uh, internal migration in the morning today, in the afternoon session, we may probably are going to touch upon uh, uh, you know, a uh, specific focus on probably Rohingyas and other things. Therefore, we need to see also how does it affect external migration? That is, people who are persecuted, who are actually having, uh, you know, uh, 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 challenges which are faced in uh, their country and they cross the international border and flee to another country and then how they are treated. That is something of context. Then also it actually goes further deep. What happens even if they're stripped of the citizenship first and then made stateless, and then made to flee, and then become a stateless refugee, as you know, we have Rohingya concerns. We have, uh, we we need to, um, you know, uh, look at that. And uh, probably this pandemic uh, has also uh, brought in in many parts of the world where there is a, almost a grounding halt uh, to many things about the closure of borders and things like that, which brings into concern how it impacts in the short term, mid term, and in the long term, uh, where the current movement restriction, uh, you know, is going to have a lasting impact. Uh, that is something very important. Are we eroding the legal obligations uh, related to access to protection under the international human rights framework and refugee law in specific or statelessness law in specific is something which we need to uh, look at and, and, and ponder. Uh, are we, uh, you know, uh, are going to break all these established practices, norms, what we call it as uh, the customary international law around uh, issues of mobility, uh, migration? We need to look at it. Uh, it also uh, reduces the beneficial impact of uh, migration to countries of destination as well as countries of origin. But that has to be seen. Can somebody, a Rohingya who is stranded in India or uh, Bangladesh wanting to return, can they return to their own country? Or the Sri Lankan refugees, for example, that they have been here for quite some time. If they are wanting to do it to return, are they in a position to return now? And we all know that how pandemic has brought in a severe restriction on all these groups. I think uh, that is something we need to uh, keep in context. Uh, no countries, we know pandemic has uh, been uh, quite uh, wide developing. And how particularly the developing nations, the global south, has been facing tremendous impact within that we are going to get these marginalized and vulnerable communities. So we need to also look at how do we make it inclusive in terms of responding with the spirit of what is called as a quote-unquote burden and responsibility sharing, uh, which has been there uh, uh, quite evolved uh, in the recent times through the uh, New York Declaration on uh, and, and the emergence of the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Migrants. These are two important compacts which have come in uh, just a couple of years before, uh, which, which governs uh, uh, many countries uh, worldwide. As I was referring the statistics, nearly about uh, 79.5 million to almost 80 million people forcefully displaced. In this, refugees alone are constituting 26 million. Internally displaced persons are around 45.7 million. The stateless persons are somewhere ranging between 5.6 million, officially quoted by UNHCR, to almost 10 million what they have mentioned in their uh, data uh, information. Uh, asylum seekers are around 4.2 million. This is how the numbers have enormously uh, emerged. And uh, and we also know that the outbreak of uh, conflicts globally in the recent decade, how uh, it has uh, increased these numbers, which were hardly about 35, 40 million. Today is touching around 80 million, the double the numbers within a decade, uh, you know, over the forced migration. So uh, you have situations of protracted conflicts in Syrian, uh, Syria, uh, Syrian conflict alone has displaced enormous amount of people within the country as IDPs, internally displaced persons, as well as uh, externally as refugees. We have South Sudan displacement crisis following their independence. Conflict in Ukraine, you have a, as a context. Arrival of refugees and migrants in Europe uh, by, uh, by sea. Massive flow of uh, stateless refugees from Myanmar to Bangladesh, Bangladesh to India, uh, and to Indonesia, Malaysia, and other Southeast Asian countries. The outflow of Venezuelan refugees, I mean, uh, people, displaced people across Latin America and Caribbean is a concern recently. The crisis in Africa, Sahel region, where conflicts and climate change are emerging uh, among the communities. Renewed conflict and security concerns in Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, Somalia. Conflict in Central African Republic and other internal displacements in Ethiopia, outbreaks of fighting and violence in Democratic Republic of Congo, 
and and the large humanitarian displacement crisis in yemen these are all you know some uh, uh, cursory look at what kind of effect globally things are happening in the last uh, one decade and the recent times how these are getting tight and how these displaces a number of people as refugees as uh, idps as uh, as uh, as as uh, you know uh, a stateless population in the territory or outside and we also know uh, you know moving to defining a little bit uh, if you have to take up uh, people who are affected in general in this pandemic and specifically these kind of marginalized and more vulnerable groups uh, like refugees and stateless if you have to look at it uh, we all know that the refugee is a person according to the uh, article 1 of the 1951 uh, convention on stateless uh, on the uh, status of refugees it defines uh, as a person who is having or who is owing to um, you know well founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race religion nationality membership of a social group or uh, or political opinion and who is outside their country of his or her nationality and is unable or owing to such fear and willing to avail himself or herself of the protection of the country so essentially somebody who has crossed the international border and been in another country and seeking protection and we know this this part of you know asia south asia in particular that we have this legal vacuum none of these countries except afghanistan which did uh, you know sign the 1951 convention and related 67 protocol none of the countries have signed india pakistan bangladesh nepal sri lanka none of them have signed so that's a matter of concern that what happens when when this population are moving and then they want to seek protection interestingly in the uh, south asian region particularly india uh, it has hosted a number of refugees we know uh, right from the time of partition the partition refugees uh, traditionally also india has hosted the zoroastrians jews during the medieval period of uh, you know 10th 11th century uh, then um, partition refugees then the tibetans who have come in uh, uh, refugees the entire uh, Uh, you know a uh, government and exile as we all know uh, has been set up in india tibetans are here for a very long time then the east pakistan refugees uh, during the emergence of bangladesh liberation of bangladesh we know uh, opening numbers of almost about 10 million people who are coming to india we have handled then we have sri lankan tamil refugees since the ethnic conflict that broke out in 1983 onwards uh, in about three or four waves uh, the sri lankan refugees are coming and then many got repatriated or resettled elsewhere even now we have even after the conflict is over for more than 10 years we have about uh, you know 1 lakh population living in uh, southern india particularly in tamil nadu in various camps and outside the camps so that uh, uh, when do they return or what kind of durable solution finally for them uh, there are uh, burmese refugees chittagong hill tribe people uh, the rohingyas which is going to be presented by uh, mr charita later Somali, Sudanese, Nigerian, and so on and so forth. So we have uh, uh, these uh, segments of refugees, which are not very huge in a way. If you look at the Indian numbers, it's ranging between 2.5 lakh to uh, uh, maximum of 3 lakh uh, population. The numbers aren't very high, and uh, given the context, uh, it has been shared. Part of the refugees are protected by uh, Indian government at the union level and at the state level, respectively, for Sri Lankan refugees or Tibetans. Uh, then there are other refugees uh, who are uh, allowed to be called as the mandate refugees uh, to be protected under the UNHCR as we all know UNHCR uh, is on a very limited uh, you know on limitation basis uh, it works in india there are limitations for UNHCR having worked briefly with UNHCR on some of their uh, repatriation programs i know that there are tremendous limitations UNHCR has and uh, it is made to work with uh, some of the groups and there are certain groups which are unclear and whose mandate they are for example if we take the rohingyas uh, we we do not know whether they are with the mandate of the government of india or with the mandate of unhcr but things are not very clear and then we also know the context in which when the, the ministry of uh, home affairs announced that uh, they going to expel the rohingyas from india uh, out of india uh, you know brought in a lot of flash point uh, internationally that uh, are we floating the the principles of non refoulement uh, uh, meaning that nobody should be forcefully uh, exited or thrown out of the country when they are already sought protection because their life will be at risk again this comes as a part of the uh, the scogens or the the customary international law that we need to protect uh, people uh, you know once they have come in and sought asylum that they shouldn't be arbitrarily uh, sent out so there this is a well established uh, international principle 
Uh, this was tested during the Sri Lankan refugee crisis in the early 90s when there was an announcement informally to uh, forcefully repatriate them. Uh, this uh, it got drew uh, the attention of the community and uh, UNHCR had to step in some senior members uh, who came from Geneva to India and, and they are to intervene. Uh, uh, they are to, uh, you know, um, advise the, the government of India uh, to not to forcefully send anybody. Uh, India interestingly responded to that and, and, and agreed that they would not uh, do so. If that is the case, then how uh, are we now forcefully expelling a particular category of uh, refugees, uh, Rohingyas in a context? Probably that will be dealt or discussed later. This also uh, we need to keep in mind. The refugee complexity, again, I know uh, if we have to uh, uh, distinguish between the developed nations and uh, the developing uh, countries. Uh, uh, you know, when we have fairly established principles within the 1951 convention to, to protect uh, them on an individual basis, we have in this part of the world where it is about, actually about groups and you know, it's about not one single identity, but, but, but together that they, they, they move around. It's a Sri Lankan refugees is not about one or two individuals, but they come in mass when the conflict escalates. We, uh, we have seen uh, since the uh, mid 80s. And 90s, uh, that how they, they come in thousands by boats to the thing. Similarly, this uh, uh, across the border migration has happened in, in, in bulk. And, and then we see a lot of tag being changed where sometimes they are internally displaced within the country. For example, Sri Lankan Tamil refugee would be internally displaced at some point of time. So they call IDPs. And, and then they even cross the international border, come to India to seek protection. So they're called uh, self seekers. Then they're given some kind of a status to stay as refugees in the camps, then they become camp refugees. And then they wish them wish themselves to return, so they become returnees, uh, repatriates, they go back to the country. And then yet again, there are conflict displaced, then they come, uh, another, come to another country. So the multiple tagging is another problem, uh, which is a very complex situation here, because of the close borders that you know people move around. That makes them all the more vulnerable uh, in terms of the movement and things like that. So uh, 60, uh, in the 51 convention and 67 protocol is something very important for uh, the refugee uh, context where uh, there has been advocacy going on from Mahanirvan Kalgata Research Group and other like-minded academic uh, institutions and uh, individuals who have been campaigning that we need to adhere to the international standards or if not, at least we should have uh, our own legislation uh, of protecting. But that isn't there and that legal vacuum is a matter of concern, I, as I mentioned in the beginning. And uh, we need to see uh, uh, that how some of the uh, judicial uh, role or the judicial uh, the judgments uh, from uh, uh, some of the uh, cases, uh, for example, the, uh, the you know in the Chittagong Hill Track people, uh, uh, you know you have a case of uh, a National Human Rights Commission versus uh, uh, the state of uh, Arunachal Pradesh, where uh, the judgments came about the right to life that you know, we need to invoke the right to life principle, which is there as a part of the fundamental rights, uh, Article 21, that you know, right to life with the dignity has to be um, you know, enhanced and uh, promoted among even these refugees or displaced population. But I think that's something interesting that that, that kind of you know, things that governed us or influenced us to uh, shape uh, some of our adopt policies. Uh, but there is a long way uh, to, to, to meet up the international standards the second category I would like to look at is the statelessness, uh, which has emerged as a matter of concern, where uh, UNHCR has a campaign that between 2014 to 2024, they want to address this issue for a decade and now we cross the mid-level. And then we see in this part of the world where uh, we are actually triggering new kinds of stateless population. We all know uh, what uh, the National Register of Citizens in RC process in Assam or the CAA, as it was talked or proposed uh, at the national level, the Citizenship Amendment Act, how these uh, two could uh, come in and pose a huge challenge uh, to the very citizens or the fluid category of uh, uh, people uh, who would have migrated. How do you uh, set a deadline and uh, I mean, timeline and how do you um, uh, look at that population? I think that is something a matter of concern where the statelessness is basically, uh, as per the international law, uh, the denial of nationality. Uh, denial, of, denial of citizenship uh, by law uh, by the nation states concern. So mostly you have these population who could be denied of the rights, but they're trapped within the country. So what happens to them? They are, they are also probably part of the labor migration, part of the... So that uh, context we all know in Assam and neighboring northeastern states, how 
as a matter of concern and many other parts of India as well that could be a matter of concern that people internally also citizens who have migrated for a very long and been internally displaced where they may not uh, be able to establish uh, their uh, papers, their identity, these all could, you know, compound into uh, new uh, levels of statelessness and then, you know, the children born to such migrants becoming, again, stateless, not being registered and all. So I think we need to entirely look at these gambit. There are international conventions, again, uh, 1954 Convention on Statelessness and 1961 Convention on uh, statelessness reduction. I think these are all, again, a matter of concern that we are, uh, again, uh, not yet signed or acceded to these uh, uh, things. But what we have is, just to conclude uh, my initial thoughts and framework, we do have a kind of a, a rights framework, access to justice framework. For example, um, we have, uh, you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 14 and 15, talk about uh, respectively the right to seek asylum and the non-deprivation of nationality in anybody. And then you have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 1 and 47, talk about the right to self-determination and uh, the, 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 the right kind of treatment of minorities. In, in, similarly, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, Article 2, Clause, sub clause 3, deals with economic rights even to non-nationals. And then you have, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, Goal number 16 in particular, talks about promoting just, peaceful, and inclusive societies. I think this provides a framework. Besides that, you have the Child Rights Convention, you have the SEDA, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which specifically talks about the migrant women, migrant children, whether they are refugees, whether they are, uh, you know, uh, internally displaced. It doesn't matter that they need to be protected and qualified for protection. These are probably some of the instruments where India is already part of it, but probably we are not part of the legal instruments vis-a-vis -vis refugee protection or status. So this again brings in a kind of a paradox, how do we look at it? Now these things are compounded in the pandemic, for the kind of a pandemic, which has come in a large way at the global level, regional level, and the national level. And these again compounds that uh, uh, the challenges to these invisible, uh, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable and marginalized uh, groups. I thought that I will flag in the beginning uh, where we need to uh, probably look at, uh, uh, you know, how do we, uh, as a democracy, uh, uh, democratic country, uh, look at uh, these categories of people, how do we protect them, what kind of laws we uh, could uh, evolve in, in a due course, what kind of good practices we could evolve and protect these uh, vulnerable populations and how do we minimize uh, the challenges of statelessness and other things to make it more inclusive and, uh, and humane so that we, we address the issue. And by and large, we need to look at uh, what kind of mobility laws and things like that come in even to address, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, across the country migration or, or migration within the countries. And whatever we have had, we don't have any statistics very clearly on even the interstate migrant laborers and, uh, and the reverse migration and other things which all were discussed in the morning. We know how tremendously it impacts uh, lots of other uh, marginalized uh, you know, groups and communities. So it is actually, I think, the time for us, we are at the crossroads to really pause uh, reflect and see uh, how we could uh, address all these issues in a very systematic way with the data, with the research, with the proper advocacy where we could engage and, and revisit all that is something, um, uh, I would call it a challenge as well as an opportunity uh, where, where we need to you know, look at it. With this um, a few words of introduction, uh, now I will uh, go on to two uh, interesting speakers. We have, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, Mr. Sen Sengupta, and uh, Dr. Samatha, uh, both are going to speak uh, respectively. Now I'll uh, pass on to uh, uh, Mr. Sharita uh, uh, to, to speak on. They're all good friends. We have been interacting with uh, the Mahanirman Calcutta Research Group. Interactions we have regularly, we have been meeting and interacting with them. Uh, it's very interesting to have uh, uh, friends on the panel. I welcome both and I hand over to now um, uh, Mr. Sharita. So over to you. <coughs> Um, thank you, Dr. Parivedan. I mean, it was uh, what a wonderful introduction. And I was wondering what all I should be skipping from my presentation already. So because there will be a lot of overlaps, uh, but uh, thanks for that. And um, I'd really um, like to thank uh, Shivnath Shastri College and uh, Mohanirvan Calcutta Research Group, almost my second home. Uh, 
uh, for this opportunity and uh, of course um, a personal note of thanks to Professor Shamulindu Mujumdar uh, for having me here. So um, please bear with me because I'll try to share my screen and I haven't done it yet in Google Meet. So I'll just um, try and check whether it works. Um, Okay, so um, can you see, uh, like, I don't think it has worked. Okay, so. Shucharita, it did work for a while. Uh, you just have to uh, okay. choose the window. Now you choose the relevant window. Okay, uh, okay, let me see whether I can. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you so much, Amutadi. Okay, so um, okay, for some reason, um, um, anyway, I'll just not be playing it probably in this way, but I, I guess this is visible, right? So I'll just do it from here. Um, so um, this is basically uh, so what I will be talking today about is what uh, uh, Dr. Parivalan has really very nicely put. Um, it is about the Rohingyas and this is a work in progress because um, I have just come back from my field in the last year and I was again supposed to go back this year, which I couldn't. So um, it's really a start of the work that I have been doing for a while now. And um, um, I will be talking a lot about the theoretical aspect, uh, about how I have situated the work. And um, later on in the second half, uh, I, I can show you uh, what my ethnography, like ethnograph data is about. Okay, so um, um, one second, I think. No, so this is not the... So for some reason I don't I'm not getting my desktop from here. Um, maybe I just should shun this. Uh, Aritra, I have mailed you. Can can you just show it by any chance? Because my desktop option is not coming here. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, just give me a moment. I'll present. Thank you. It. Because uh, the options are, yeah. If it works fine, otherwise it's okay. I mean, just I'll read out. Uh, Ma'am, is it visible? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe if you just can make it a full screen. Okay. Um, is it visible now? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. This. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, uh, the next slide. So, that's the outline of my presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation where, um, so basically, um, we all know the first slide talks about, um, um, okay, yeah, um, about, about a story that started in the 1940s, which still has a profound significance in how nation states have been conceived in South Asia. And um, you know questions surrounding nationality, citizenship, and identity are recurring themes now. And as we see NRC, CAA, and all of that, it is ever more than ever pertinent. So uh, the context of Rohingya, I have situated in there. That is about the first slide, and this is the outline of the presentation today. Where in the part uh, one, I have uh, tried to theoretically put my work and in the second half I will be talking about uh, my field work experiences I'm not reading out it's all there so um, the prism through which I have situated my research is through the concept of statelessness um, the case of the Rohingya and the meaning and implications of statelessness in this presentation are approached through refugee studies uh, the next slide please um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so there is an emerging school of thought within statelessness now that does not look at statelessness as a lack, because then 
it gives too much emphasis on the structure of the modern state that considers the state as the sacrosanct entity. So this school of thought therefore argues that defined in this way, statelessness matters only when it is considered in terms of the state. Now, um, therefore, um, denial of citizenship in their home country, that of Myanmar, could be looked at a, as a lack and victimization of a population. However, it is also pertinent that we contextualize the problems that Rohingyas are facing in Myanmar and the subsequent persecution and their resettlement in Europe, in Bangladesh and in India within the context of statelessness in order to understand their uh, movement for citizenship. So my uh, fieldwork was in Bangladesh, so I will not be touching upon India or other parts, uh, which I'll uh, refer to in the second half. So if we consider statelessness, whether if we consider it a lack or not, it is undeniable that our age can be called as the age of life or biopolitics. That is politics, which is organized within the state to control life and regulate life. So life which is regularized and controlled by the governmental policy and free market is therefore regulating politics as well. The query, what is life within this kind of an existence therefore is an arrogant one. This articulation of life as Yasmin Arif has pointed out, as it leaves or dies through its decay inscribes an emerging dynamic fluid constitutes an even more complex phenomenon that of the Rohingyas. Um, Oritru, can we have the next slide? Uh, okay, yeah, and, and the next one, please. Thank you, because this is done. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you so much. So now I um, basically come to the, uh, this was the introduction to the larger work, and now I come to the um, theoretical aspect of statelessness, which uh, Dr. Parivaran has already covered. So I will try to skip through. Basically, as you now well understand that statelessness is an existence when people are without a formal citizenship status. Concern with stateless population was prevalent during the decade of the 20s, following the First World War, when many people were rendered stateless in the wake of the international passport system in 1920. In the post-World War period, the civil wars in Russia and genocide in the Ottoman Empire had rendered million people stateless. Now, the Nansen, Nansen passport was created then, which had not granted citizenship status to the families, but it had at least allowed movement across borders. So it was basically after the end of the Second World War in 1954 that we saw the definitive emergence of the meaning of the term stateless. So far, it has been mainly defined or studied within the ambit of international law. However, although international laws have provided some parameters that try to explain and protect people from being devoid of nationality, Many times, stateless people who need asylum have been denied so, as we see the case of the Rohingyas. They are both stateless and recognized by UNHCR as refugees. In legal terms, there are two forms of statelessness. Uh, I'll just briefly say this, there's de jure and de facto, and Rohingyas fall under the de jure category, which is uh, they are basically deracinated and scattered through their mobility across international borders in South and Southeast Asia. So UNHCR aiming to eradicate statelessness by 2024 mentions how the 1954 convention is of critical importance in current times as millions of people are still stateless. Yet, too little people are signatories to these conventions, like, you know, India and Bangladesh are not sig non signatories to the conventions, and hence the Rohingyas are not even recognized as refugees in either of the two countries. So now statelessness can have a severe impact on the lives of the individuals concerned, as well as on the internal and international affairs of states. 
This is in part due to the role that nationality as membership plays in the formation of people's identities and the connection that they feel to the place where they live and the people around them. So the possible consequences of statelessness are profound and touch on all aspects of life. It may not be possible for stateless people to work legally, to purchase property or to open a bank account. Stateless people may be easy prey for exploitation as cheap labor that I have witnessed in the camps of Bangladesh. And I'm sure it is the same story in India, in Malaysia, in all the countries that they are scattered throughout the world. So they are not also permitted to attend schools or university. Basically, they are not allowed any formal education. They may be prohibited from getting married with persons from other communities and may not be able to register like they cannot register births and deaths um and th this is country wise but uh, even in the in the camps of bangladesh the registration of births it used to take place once but now it has completely stopped so stateless people can neither vote nor access the national justice system but they can nonetheless and this is the catch you know like from where they can actually ask for their rights because they can actually voice out their rights for simply being human. The guarantee that human rights based on an individual that Dr. Parivalan actually mentioned the articles 14 and 15, which are in universal declarations of human rights. So basically, uh, it is within this lie that the study of Rohingya refugees become pertinent because they have posed a huge challenge the categories of nation states, how modern nation states are visualized. And if we consider whether we, we should be considering them as you know the given parameters, because if we then take a, 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 the modern nation state as the, as the most normal institution, then the Rohingyas definitely pose a challenge. So uh, with this, I, I move on to the second part of my presentation. That is my, uh, my field experiences in Bangladesh. And uh, Oritru, if you could just uh, show the next slides, uh, because I have pictures. OK, uh, yeah, OK, yeah. Mm, can, uh, can it be full screened? Because it's coming very in a very short way. Um, so is it visible? Uh, Okay, uh, so th so there is a timeline that I have written in this slide. Um, is is this visible? Okay, it, it so so this is this is a timeline of the of the genocide, um, and I have written genocide or conflict with a question mark. It is because there is a debate. There is an increasing debate in the uh, in the something is happening. Okay, um, uh, uh, Ritra, can we see the slide again? This one. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so so basically, there is this huge debate now uh, within um, within scholars who are studying the issue, uh, the issue of Rohingya, whether this should be defined as a genocide, which UNHCR has actually defined uh, the problem or you know, like not the problem, but the persecution as genocide, not even ethnic cleansing. Uh, genocide is a proper legal term. Um, or as in the West, many scholars prefer writing it as a conflict, uh, which is kind of denounced by the activists, by Rohingya activists who are working throughout the world, because if, if it is termed as conflict, it essentially involves two parties and genocide means what has been happening in my like it has been a systematic genocide and i have mentioned the years here uh, because it, it's such a vast topic that uh, i didn't want to go a lot to the history but i have marked here if you can read it i don't know it's uh, the first major persecution when almost 40000 rohingyas had uh, 
uh, moved to Bangladesh. That is how it started. I mean, the largest one million plus population settlement that exists now in Bangladesh is actually existing there from the 70s, late 70s. And it is, it is really uh, ironical that uh, it, it's now is such a huge, uh, it draws such a huge attention now. But back in the 70s and in the 90s, Calcutta Research Group is one of the uh, first organizations that actually started research uh, on this issue long back, uh, it was uh, not even in the media. So this problem exists therefore since uh, since late 70s. And then the, the second wave came around 1991, 92, uh, when again a major persecution took place. Then 2012 was, um, was a big, uh, there, there was a big clash. And it is actually called <clears throat> conflict or kind of a civil war. Um, 2015 was a landmark year. I've written it simply because uh, um, not of any persecution that uh, actually happened or exodus that happened in 2015, but it is important because uh, there was this entire boat crisis that the Rohingyas were subjected to at that point of time. And incidentally, it was this year um, uh, through the boat, boat crisis that uh, they they became visible in in global media. Uh, before that, uh, pretty much people even in India were, as I said, uh, except for one or two organizations, people didn't know. So uh, and also 2015 November um, uh, was the change in government, like the military regime went, and it was supposed to be a start of a new era, democratization of uh, of Myanmar politics, which unfortunately hasn't happened yet. So and then uh, I um, 2017 was the final and last year of Exodus, which has been the biggest so far because almost I have written the figure there if you can read it, but it was almost it's like more than 60 to 70,000 people uh, had to leave uh, um, Arakan, Myanmar. Uh, and moved to Bangladesh, uh, and uh, um, so the population now, the the camps in Bangladesh, they have more than one million Rohingya refugees. So, um, as some of you might be knowing, Myanmar is currently facing proceedings in the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, and this is brought by Gambia in Hague uh, under the Genocide Convention. That is why I mentioned why. Um, genocide is actually very important to the discussion and it is important to mention it because it's a legal term and on basis of which the case is going on now. Uh, so can can we have the next slides? And also this is a map uh, of Myanmar. Thank you. So this is, um, uh, this is a picture that I took uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, so this is uh, 25 August 2017 was the day when the maximum number of people were compelled to leave. It was a violent clash and women were raped, people were killed. I have met a lot of victim families among the new, uh, uh, new settlers of the camps who migrated post-2017 August and uh, it, it's absolutely, it's very gross. So 25th was the day and post like 2017, 25 August, this day is now um, a sort of has become a remembrance day for the Rohingyas in the camps. And even I think in India they do, but I, I do not, uh, I haven't looked into the, uh, the Indian path that much, but in Bangladesh, this is how they uh, kind of spend the day by organizing silent protests they cannot do a lot and actually in 2019 this was the last uh, we do not know whether this can continue because uh, after this happened immediately from september 2009 uh, the bangladesh government initiated a clamp down a more stringent approach towards the refugees uh, maybe because they thought that this is um, this might jeopardize the relationship the political and diplomatic relationship that Myanmar has been having with Bangladesh in trying to repatriate the refugees since 2017 November but it has still now failed 
so and there are this uprisings and there are this discontents that are happening in the camps in parts of the refugees who for like two three years now have been really um, very tolerant and very silent but now sort of patience is wearing thin on both parts so uh, from september things have gone very bad in the camps and there is absolutely no internet connection um so basically no connectivity but i'll come to that a bit later uh, so if you can show the next slide also um because uh, these are my pictures uh, these are also how they kind of spend the genocide day and you can see a lot of women involvement women volunteers also in this so uh, there are actually initiatives i have not touched upon gender at all in this presentation because i couldn't bring it all um within 10 minutes but yes i mean uh, the important in this context and how women how uh, refugee women actually cross so many boundaries it's not the geographical and physical boundaries but boundaries so many domestic boundaries and uh, this, this is a very novel thing that has happened in the camps most of these women were completely um in those were supposed to be completely in those when they were in Myanmar so uh, but then again this is also changing is what i have heard so um according to a recent report the situation of rohingyas living in Myanmar has further deteriorated after the as i said uh, after the 2017 clearing operations um so in the in the slide 6 if you remember like in the where, where i have showed the map basically it's a map of the region arakan from where the rohingyas have been uh, persecuted and they had to flee it uh, so so arakan is known as rohang or uh, roshan roshan godesh um pardon my uh, my pronunciation it is situated on the tri-border region between modern day Myanmar, Bangladesh and India. And also the nomenclature, the pronunciation is also very, like it, it, is, uh, it is very tricky because in the camps, they, they, many of them refer to themselves as Rohingya, but then the activists prefer saying Rohingya. So there is, I, I'm still working on it. I, I, I haven't yet reached a conclusion. Um, so basically, Arakan covers an area of about 20,000 square miles uh, in Myanmar and borders 176 miles with Bangladesh, of which 48 miles is covered by the Naf River. So I have a picture of Naf River in the presentation. Uh, if you can show the next slide. Um, uh, Aritra, if you could show the next slide. But anyway, so, um, so it is through... Okay, this, uh, this is, so this is the border. Uh, this is the Technaf road border where the Naf River, uh, Naf River is actually situated. So uh, the next slide, please. Um, yes, so, so this is, uh, this led to an open discontentment among the old refugees and the new witness when I was there. So, uh, I met a lot of youths uh, in all the 34 camps. I couldn't cover it all, but you know, all of them between the age group of 15 to 20 said as refugees, they're entitled to basic rights. So this very thing that they told me, this was absent when I went to the camps in 2015. And when I spoke to them then, like, you know, the older generation of the Rohingya refugees, it was completely a different ambience. It was much more sad. Of course, the sadness is still there, but it's it's very different from what it used to be. With so much of media attention, it's like a refugee tourism over there because the entire region has completely changed from Cox's Bazaar to the camp area. There are new restaurants. There are people... Uh, uh, there are hotels, four-star, five-star hotels for people who are working in the INGOs like, uh, say, IOM and UNHCR. So it has completely changed. And this has, in turn, empowered the refugees to kind of voice out because a lot of them are employed by these international um, organizations as uh, interpreters and volunteers. So they, they know they know of their rights now. Um, so, so they agree to the fact that only food and shelter are really not what they demand. They were like, okay, yeah, we are getting food and shelter, but we want something more. We want education. 
otherwise and they, uh, i'm quoting some of them otherwise this will lead to frustration depression angst and a lack of unity of mistrust this is what they told me when i asked about the uh, you know the disunity among them and this is what their responses were that um, isn't this but very inevitable we cannot trust each other we do not trust each other and there is a competition constant competition who gets more access to the amenities uh, provided by the ngos and i ngos so in their bid to change their lives these young refugees were waiting for that one opportunity to get enrolled in universities of bangladesh now the will to break break free is so utmost and urgent that making false national identity cards of bangladesh even despite such stringent measures is very much prevalent the ones who could afford paying a hefty sum to local agents is on a rise and i i saw it myself happening in front of me so so this is happening through uh, local brokers basically bangladeshi citizens who are working as local brokers in helping the refugees out in exchange of a heavy hefty sum of money there is also as i said a clamor uh, for attention um uh, and also a lack of representation although there are prominent voices now from within the community across in europe and elsewhere but there is no coherent voice of protest that has come out as a result fragmentation has increased not only in the camps but all over the world and there is a kind of uh, sort of uh, a break somewhere it's not the efforts at the ground and uh, whatever is happening in terms of activism in europe and world they are not completely in sync to each other in the camps for instance when i asked about this very you know famed international activists um they said that but we are not getting anything and we don't know what is happening in the outside world so uh, this is something that is also happening in terms of uh, of rights and mobilizations among the people so there is particular there is one particular uh, person i want to mention zubair who was my interlocutor and who helped me a lot one of my interlocutors actually um invited me inside his uh, house and for a non hindu minded in the camps it was very difficult because i was asked what was my religion for like three or four times uh, and they were very surprised because for them buddhists uh, with whom they are in direct conflict in myanmar are also hindus for them it's all the same so they were very surprised how i Uh, how like being a hindu i am there uh, trying to be their friend as they saw me so there was a gaze also so the ones who lacked uh, th- so this is about the established rohingyas who could manage to dole out money and uh, um, cross over like zubair's sister crossed over to malaysia when i was there but the ones who lacked money and establishment in myanmar are the actual lot who are living in the most deplorable conditions as they are dependent solely on the ration provided by the world food program so in collaboration and this is done uh, uh, in collaboration with the bangladesh government so uh, there is another person whom i had met like mohammad aziz who used to work in this child friendly space by a local ngo and he also stressed on education now what is a child friendly space it is basically a space run by multiple ngos pre- present in more or less all the camps where children are hello sucharita sorry to interrupt yes, you wrap yes, up in yes, 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 absolutely absolutely so? i'm i'm done actually yeah, thank so, you yeah Please thank continue. you thank Please you so continue. much so so basically uh, so so these are spaces where the children are supposed to be educated but then what i heard from all this uh, like you know the people who who were open vocal and helping me out and they have their own groups of activists also in the camps so they said that nothing happens in this child friendly spaces and the teachers who are recruited by the uh, ngos are they also do not care much and uh, so th- so there is a lot of animosity also between the ngo workers and the refugees in terms of their relationship be- because lots of ngo workers that i conversed with though they were there to uh, help the refugees they were very um, very exhausted and weary of the situation and they didn't they couldn't see the end to it and they were like we are uh suffering also because the host communities are also under a lot of pressure now so um in order to conclude 
the generosity with with which bangladesh had greeted in the last two years the refugees has for long now been kind of dwindling and yeah i have a lot of pictures in the next slides you just can show them um so um so in my several rounds of conversations with government officials there were people who off record told me uh, that how they how they are unable to understand what the what the main uh, leaders in the decision takers are doing and they were of the opinion that you know they should be repatriated anyhow because we cannot we we are unable to take this burden even if our hearts go out to them we just cannot uh, carry this on any more and that end with what uh, professor paul banerji said in the first session you know what is a new normal as you know th this entire uh, the condition that we are living in we are constantly asking what is normal and what is uh, what is going to be the new normal but then in that in that context i was wondering what is going to be the normal of of refugees because there is this entire debate that their lives are also not normal i mean from agamben to recent scholars so what is a new normal for them as uh, you know if i just sh briefly quote gj who says that there will be no return to normal the new normal will have to be constructed on the ruins of our old lives so this is uh, he was referring to the pandemic situation of course and um, i leave this with uh, with maybe this is the normal that refugees have to stateless refugees in particular have to endure and we kind of should not be looking at it as abnormal anymore and we should be accepting it and stop looking at them as only victims and not victims so with that thank you so much and thank you aritra for this so sorry for troubling you no thank you very much uh, uh, sucharita um, uh, you have provided a very comprehensive account of uh, the uh, uh, challenges of persecution and other discriminations almost leading to a kind of a, a genocide uh within Myanmar how the Rohingyas uh, face the challenges and you dealt in detail about uh, their camp conditions in Bangladesh which is very very uh, insightful in terms of uh, how they are packed uh, uh, you know uh, in a very very con congested environment so their conditions of uh, uh, mental health issues gender issues livelihood issues and almost the camp for life and everydayness is something very very important for us to understand how they face the uh, othering and uh, the, the continuous challenges uh, in the uh, camp life i think that's something uh, very comprehensive very interesting i think um, the questions are coming in but we will take it in the end in a combined manner next i would like to invite uh, dr samta biswas uh, uh, yeah over to you dr samta uh, yes, thanks, Pari, uh, and thank you, Shucharita, uh, for that excellent presentation. Uh, I have to apologize a couple of times. Uh, one, uh, I apologize because I did not have inter uh, electricity since morning, and I had to come to a friend's house, which uh, enabled me to uh, sort of uh, to present, be part of this now. So I have a PowerPoint, which is unfortunately pretty sad. So please bear with me because of that. And the second bit is uh, to uh, a few of you are common, uh, were part of the previous uh, or workshop seminar that was organized by uh, Netaji Shotobarshiki Mohabiddaloy and Calcutta Research Group. So you will find about 35% of my presentation uh, to be the same as before, but not more than 35%, I promise. So uh, was my uh, window visible? Uh, if I could have a feedback, then I'll just go back to it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, since the morning, uh, I uh, caught it uh, on the phone in the taxi uh, on YouTube. Uh, since morning, the speakers and the participants have deliberated at length about the present pandemic and its implications for different kinds of migrant populations. I am going to do the same, but I shall also bring into focus what we have learned from history, both the history of 2000 years ago and a more recent past, uh, and uh, deliberate upon what lessons the, did history have for us and how we have managed to forget that history. 
on Thursday morning, uh, sorry, on Tuesday morning, we learned that ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency of the United States, has declared that foreign students residing in the US have to go back to home if their classes are uh, now being conducted in the online mode. So basically, if you are anyway being taught online, why should you live in the United States? You go home and live there. ICE is famous for or infamous for really violent ways of protecting the USA from what they call illegal aliens. They shoot and destroy water bottles left on the desert for helping people crossing the desert. They also prosecute people who want to leave those water bottles there. They run detention centers, and there's a lot of harassment that goes on in detention centers. But uh, the question is, why does ICE and its parent organization, the Department of Homeland Security, and you will remember that the Department of Homeland Security, or the DHS, was set up after 9-11. Why do they want to be rid of immigrants, of foreign students, in the middle of a pandemic? We also have to remember that foreign students are not the only groups that have been targeted. Since March, more than 400 people of Haitian origin have been forcibly deported to Haiti. Uh, Haiti is a country which has only three ICU beds. And it had not seen any causes uh, of coronavirus infection. It is with the people who were forcibly deported back to Haiti that the first set of infections came in. This photo that I have here is of an Haitian uh, national who was deported from the US. And this image is of him having reached the airport at Haiti. But contrary to what it looks like, this man is not giving thanks. He is repeating what many others who have come back to Haiti have done, they are protesting the fact that they have been forcibly deported. They have been forcibly deported because they may not have had the correct papers. Often, people have been these people have been away for 30 to 40 years. Often, they do not have any living family members left in Haiti. However, in the eyes of the border and law enforcement agencies of the United States, these are immigrants. And after they finish their allotted visa, uh, they have to go back. Uh, now, so the question that I am going to ask, and this is something that uh, Sandro Mezadra and Maurice Steer in their recent Open Democracy essay have pointed out, that uh, this what this virus has brought out is that the migrants embody in the harshest way the contradictions and tensions surrounding the freedom of movement, but simultaneously the denial of movement. So this, when we have a set of restrictive measures in place, and this was remarked upon at uh, in extension uh, in the morning, we uh, the, the population that we have managed to restrict are the ones who were further mobile, and the ones who did not want to move are now being made to move. Sorry to interrupt, ma'am. Your screen has been not been presented. Oh, okay. You need to present the screen. Sorry to interrupt you. So you didn't see it all this while. No, 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 ma'am. You are visible to us. Okay. <laughs> I'll try this again. Yes, yes, ma'am. Or else, orator, if orator has a PowerPoint, he can present a screen like you did in Russian. You, ma'am, you, you try, you try, you try. Can you see this now? Yes, ma'am. Now it is present. Yes, ma'am. No. Did you see the Haitian man? Can you see the Haitian man? Yes, ma'am. We can. Oh, all right. So, yeah, that's my Haitian man who is uh, at the airport and who is... Uh, protesting the fact that he has been forcibly deported and made to go back to a place he no longer calls home. Now, so the question then we are asking is, what is the relationship between this present pandemic and its attack on the immigrants? The word attack is a term I use deliberately. Because using the pandemic, authoritarian regimes around the world have imposed bans and lockdown that have adversely affected internal migrants, uh, let's say in the case of India, they have affected uh, internally displaced people, refugees who are either stuck at refugee camps or at international borders. And in the case of several groups of Rohingyas in boats, 
So there's this really heartwarming news that we read about how the Indonesians are. Uh, overcame the lockdown measures and their fear of the virus to rescue stranded rohingyas from boats so people who have migrated legally uh, in you know with a valid visa not as refugees or as asylum seekers even they are no better in the us visas are not being renewed even for people who have been long time residents uh, in germany and in the and in india people who are being repatriated are only legal citizens of those places they are not long time residents of those places so this slide here this is an image from berlin uh, this hashtag leave no one behind is about repatriation measures extradition me measures that germany was carrying out in which germany was only bringing back german citizens not people who had lived in germany for 20 30 years we know that one can live legally in another country through various means they do not necessarily have to be a part a citizen of that country however when nations have to choose they are choosing citizens as opposed to long term residents or permanent residents now uh, at the same time we also have uh, the case of a lot of migrant workers who are employed in essential services so they could be people who are in sanitation work people who are agricultural laborers so a lot of people who work in uh, agriculture in uh, canada in italy in uk are migrants from elsewhere so they continue to work although we are supposedly practicing uh, social distancing and lockdown measures they continue to work in conditions which are extremely unsanitary and unhygienic now another reason why i use the term attack on the migrants is because attack is also a term which is in keeping with the discourse of war that has been deployed to describe the pandemic situation we have raged a war on the virus our defenses have to be built against the enemy and in the social terms the enemy is the outsider this linkage between the outsider and the migrant the alien and the epidemic is not new in fact we find this linkage from its etymology the word epidemic uh, stands in for uh, a disease that tends to affect a disproportionately large number of people within a population community or a region at the same time the word pandemic stands when over a large geographical area the disease is spread yesterday uh, crg had its second webinar and we discussed how in the globalized world order the mega machines of logistics were the first that had crossed the national borders so we have special transit zones we have freight corridors we have container traffic we have special permits and the national borders were under globalization were no longer a barrier for these things uh, moving with the lockdown globally the first things that have stopped are these logistical corridors and that's why we have such anxiety over trade we have anxiety over how uh, you know the economy can be resuscitated etc but i will go back to uh, the sl uh, slide before and point at jean delmo who says that this thing about blaming the migrants is not something new in human history collectively as a society we always end up turning our aggression towards those who we consider to be foreigners those who are travelers and those who are marginalized people people we cannot integrate into what we think is our community our society our notion of a normal so and in times of crisis this escalates we find one point of origin which we uh, considered to be the source of the contagion the source of the pollution the source of the uh, crisis and unfortunately historically those have been the migrants i come to the example of sophocles uh, oedipus rex this is a text that we teach uh, i teach at the university uh, in this first performed in 429 bc the citizens of thebes come to their king oedipus asking to be delivered from the plague that is killing the unborn children the young and the old flowers on the trees begin to droop even before they bloom crops die the divine messenger tells oedipus that the answer lies in a foreigner who has been living in thebes this foreigner has committed great sins 
he has polluted this country now we know whose sins these are we know who that foreigner is or for that matter how this play ends but this may be one of the first artistic expressions of treating the migrant as inherently polluting and polluted the mere presence of the migrant has as if brought disease upon the land however outlandish it may sound let's ask ourselves whether we have uh, behaved any differently there is a historical reason why uh, sophocles is writing what he is writing because the greek politician and historian thucydides was sophocles's contemporary thucydides records that the plague of athens that originally began in ethiopia traveled through egypt libya into the greek mediterranean world killing more than 70000 people so when we read sophocles's invocation of the plague as a result of the pollution brought in by the migrant it does not seem so strange after all around 250 ad the plague of cyprian killed around 5000 people the romans blamed the christians not that the christians were not being killed by the plague but because the christians were the minorities the christians were the marginalized similarly there is this illustration of the bubonic plague in the 14th century the black death during which time it was believed that uh, it had originated in the far east it was introduced into europe in the 1340s by ships it killed approximately 34 million europeans and 16 million asians and is among the most fatal infectious disease outbreaks in recorded history but something else happened at the same time there were widespread attacks on the jews in europe remember the jews are the original diaspora they are the original migrants but historically they are also the ones who have been persecuted across europe in different cities in europe we found uh, a whole bunch of uh, attacks on the ghettos although the jews were dying just like everyone else was dying and if you look at the bottom of the page you will see that there are these are the different names with which the 17th century black death uh, Uh, after the 1640s uh, and the 1660s was called so they were called hungarian plague swedish plague plague of milan so it's the same event which is killing people all across europe but depending upon where you are you are blaming different people so you are blaming the hungarians you are blaming the swedes you are blaming the milanese in cyprus christians were attacking muslim slaves in russia the tartars were being murdered and the english were blaming the dutch in contrast to this we have the example of the colombian exchange colombian exchange is named after the voyager christopher columbus it is the name given to the exchange and travel of food culture and diseases between the americas in europe but remember with the spanish conquistadors came diseases before the invasion of the new world that is the two americas the americas did not have any smallpox measles chicken pox influenza typhus typhoid parathyroid fever fever diphtheria cholera or bubonic plague scarlet fever or whooping cough or malaria so the list of the things that we have on the right are the diseases that the european settlers have carried in to uh, the the two americas it is estimated that upwards of 80 to 95% of the native american population was decimated within the first 100 to 150 years following 1492 the year when columbus reaches it brought about the fall of the mighty aztec and the incan civilizations but it is only in the historiography of the 20th century that we start to have an estimate of the disease that colonialism had taken to its colonies because what we hear is the opposite we hear about how the colonies exported diseases to europe we uh, hear of the europeans who came to the tropics and quickly succumbed to mysterious fevers and to cholera so much so that till well into the 20th century diseases were named after their supposed places places of origin so you had asiatic cholera asiatic flu asiatic plague etc we are constantly talking about 1918 the influenza pandemic but remember while america referred to it as spanish flu the spaniards referred to it as french flu in the early 1900s we have the case of mary malone or 
one who was more famously known, infamously known as Typhoid Mary, although Columbus was never known as Malaria Columbus or Cholera Columbus or Diphtheria Columbus. Uh, Mary Malone was an Irish immigrant working in New York, and she was diagnosed as being an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid and apparently was responsible for eight families contracting typhoid from her while she worked with them as a cook. Uh, Malone was, would in today's term, be called a super spreader. And just like today, she was quarantined. But not, unlike us, she was quarantined for 26 years. And we ask if she was not an immigrant and not a poor person, would we have given her the name of Typhoid Mary? With this, I come to the end of the 20th century, and I look at our immediate history, that of the HIV AIDS pandemic. We know, again, all throughout the world, the HIV AIDS has been linked to uh, the African populations. But it's interesting and it's really illustrative to look at how the connection with migration helped the African cause in certain ways. So by the 1980s, we have a new theory coming up uh, in which the proliferation of HIV AIDS in South Africa is being uh, connected to the male migrant infector. What is the male migrant infector? The male migrant who goes to work in the diamond mines across Africa and through his circular migration and through his practices, he ends up infecting many of women who are associated with him. Now, why did, all, despite there uh, not being enough evidence, why did the medical practitioners and the practitioners of health geography chance upon this? They seized upon this male migrant infector model. This is a model that they are borrowing from the 1940s syphilis outbreak, also in South Africa. So they are borrowing this because this seems to be a better model than what was prevalent before which is the African promiscuity model. So look at the two models that we are being given. One is a racist model. The African is promiscuous. Therefore, the African has AIDS. And the second is an anti-migrant model because the African travels so much that he has AIDS. Incidentally, none of them seem to be true if you take them in isolation of the social factors that contribute to migration. So the po poverty, apartheid, and all of the other things that were taking place in South Africa of that time. Also, a very, very recent study of 2015, which studies more than 200,000 migrants into Europe, they claim that of the 63% migrants who were infected by HIV AIDS, they were infected after the migrate. So it's not like migrants are carrying the infection with them. They are going to a new place and they are getting infected. Uh, health researchers and UN agencies have claimed that there are five factors which link migration to the spread of AIDS. And what are these five factors? Displacement, military activity, economic disruption, psychological stress, and, and increased migration. Infection, increased infection has been found along migration routes. And increased infection have been found along militarization. Why militarization? Because UN agencies report that military personnel are more likely to force sex upon people and less because the people that they are administering are powerless in comparison to them. And they are less likely to be using protection. I'll add to this that for the longest time, among refugees and migrants, reproductive health has not been uh, addressed at all. Chuturita did not address the question of gender in her presentation, but when the uh, Rohingya started coming in post-2015, especially after 2017, there had been so many pregnancies in the Rohingya camp in Bangladesh that it was quite obvious that the women were coming into the camps, and even while they were in the camp, they were repeatedly being uh, raped in the process of coming there and in the camp themselves. And how, when we imagine health for the migrants, and in extension, we imagine health for the population as the biopolitical model of our present society asks us to imagine, we don't take into consideration reproductive health at all. Now, HIV AIDS is something that we have not been uh, in 
mindful of in our recent past. But more things happened into in the 21st century that had also reached epidemic proportions. Often they had also reached pandemic proportions. Two of those examples are uh, Ebola and Zika. Zika travels from East Africa to Southeast Asia to Central and Southern America. Uh, Ebola tra also travels uh, from Africa. However, the problem with the Ebola travel is that uh, just like it is taking place now, you have Australia and many European countries stopping the uh, travel of people who are from Africa or healthcare practitioners who have been working in Africa. We see the same way in which prejudice works historically and is working in our present moment, also taking place during the Ebola crisis. On the left, you have uh, uh, this map of South America where the rest of the world have decided to quarantine them. And they've decided that this is the only way that the Ebola can be uh, taken care of. You have Haitian, Haitians being targeted in Brazil, although in Haiti, there had been no Ebola outbreak. And on the right, you have this image, this American cartoon, which talks about how Ebola fear operates alongside the panic against migrants. And when the number of infections increase, the panic suddenly decreases. So one of the questions that we have been asking uh, for uh, his, the history of epidemiology and of migration has been asking is, do travel restrictions actually work? And if you now go back to all that has been written for HIV AIDS, for Zika, and for uh, Ebola, they are more or less unilateral in declaring that travel restrictions actually do not work. Why do they not work? Because uh, they say that it is more important to take care of the populations after they arrive than stop people from moving because people are more unlikely to move into a place uh, and carry with them certain kinds of infections if they have a safe place to go to. So, but what is happening instead is that when we are looking at this present moment, at the moment of pandemic, we see this pandemic has somehow taken over our existing world order. And it is affecting forced migrants as well as internally displaced people in a way which is extremely unhuman. Uh, it's as if we are taking away from these people whatever human rights that they had had. So what are the different ways in which migrants are being affected by the pandemic? You have people stranded all across the world. For example, you have Indian workers stranded in Nepal. You have migrant workers, especially those who are uh, employed in agricultural sector, who are typically contractual, those who are lowly paid, who continue to go to work. They put themselves and others at risk. As a result, you have an increasing xenophobia. You have migrants being vilified. You have a continuing distinction between the citizen and the non-citizen. You have refugees and displaced people living in crowded and unsanitary conditions. Again, Shuturita has written for us this thing about uh, what happens when the uh, uh, coronavirus reach reaches the Rohingya refugee camp. So often the camps do not even have water with which they can wash their hands. So they have to carry water in for their daily chores and then to also mention hygienic practices. So this makes the risk of catching and spreading diseases much higher. And the worst problem probably is that you cannot stop migration in this manner. Migration will continue because many people across the globe are forced to move. However, the problem remains that the routes will become underground. The, the migration will be carried out through smugglers and traffickers. So the question for us then is, what do we do? Do we stop travel restrictions? Do we not tr stop travel rest restrictions? And I would refer you to a very, very poignant article because uh, by uh, oncologist Kobit Dashgupta, Bangla article in a uh, uh, Chanombor platform, which is a website, he argues that the coronavirus is a disease. You cannot let the disease have control over everything. Our task should be that we combat the disease, but not at the expense of people. We combat the disease while protecting the people. If we look at our present moment, the questions we ask is, what have we done instead? 
we have seen a strengthening of totalitarian regimes across the world for example hungary and of russia and i'm not talking about places closer home we have seen a deepening of existing inequalities along gender religion caste and other factors so the question for us then in this moment in which we are poised to think and act how do we envision another society that is inclusive and it does not operate on the basis of exclusions exclusions along citizenships exclusions uh, along formalization of labor and exclusion along all the other existing inequalities with this question i shall end my presentation thank you thank you samitha for a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation on tracing the uh, uh, epidemiology of almost uh, you know uh, disease uh, constituting epidemics and pandemics uh, starting with uh, so called uh, count of plague the bubonic uh, plague the spanish flu or spanish cum french flu ebola hiv h1n1 pandemic influenza and then you concluded with uh, uh, nice approach of how to uh, you know uh, avoid exclusion and how to make it very inclusive in terms of addressing the very uh, pandemic itself and how to address the related issues uh, associated with it and i think it's a very interesting platform so we have uh, two um, uh, presentations uh, do we go for a q and a now or should we have the uh, film screening and then take the q and a Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Parivelan. Uh, I think we should move to the uh, film screening now. I will present my screen and I will play the uh, short film titled "Calcutta: A Migrant City" on my laptop. Uh, however, I foresee that there may be some buffering issues or some uh, frame drops. In which case, the participants can open their email and they have also been given the YouTube link to the. a uh, short film so they can watch it from there as well so if you'll allow me i'll just present my screen right now sure after the film screening we will take the question and answer thank you yes sir Hello. Is the Aritru. film being screened now? Are it through? Are it through? Ah yes. Uh, is there any problem? Yes. Are it through? The sound. Is, yeah. Speak. The sound is not there. So we can do something. We can mail the link of the 
this short film to all of the participants so that they can see it in the YouTube themselves. Uh, so yes, I, I have the... already mailed it. I will also, uh, Freddy, could you just paste the link in the chat section? So okay, the... I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Uh, I will also I will. try to do the same for the Google, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, YouTube live stream. I think that would be a better option than playing okay. it from my okay. computer. All right, in that case, should we go for the question and answer session now? Yes, sir, we can shift on to the question and answer session. Yeah, great. Uh, and uh, somebody is going to pass on the questions to the respective uh, panelists. Uh, sir, uh, I... Um, I have two questions here with me. Uh, one is to Shucharita Shengupto. It has been asked by Isha De. Her question is, at what point people start identifying themselves as refugees, diaspora or migrant diaspora? And how far does these kinds of labeling help or hinder their process of development? Okay. Um, sorry, I can't see the question. Uh, scroll down. I think it is there. Yeah, the uh, last one, right? Yeah. Yes. Ma'am, I will ping the question. You have any other, one second. Because I, other, I... Any other questions to Sucharita also? Yeah, any other yes, questions? There, there was a question questions. at the there beginning are, which I actually yeah, noticed. But, there are two okay. questions, both the questions. I'm yeah. in the it could be, if it will be, Sucharita will be useful if you could combine and take about three to four minutes. To yeah, ex uh, yeah, I'll just read. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have posted both the questions in the chat box. Uh, Sreddy, just to uh, interrupt, interrupt you, I think mm -hmm. uh, the questions have been mailed to the uh, moderator and the speakers as well. Yes, uh, they've been mailed. Okay. Yes, so okay. they're in our mailboxes. Yeah, I have uh, okay. pinned them in the chat box too. Yes, yes, we could see the questions. Yes, please, uh, Sucharita, you could read yeah. them and uh, respond. Yeah. So, uh, so the first question I'm going to combine with the last one because uh yeah yeah so so this is um about how uh refugee women experiences are uh, about how rohingya women are different so basically uh it has to be understood in the context of the society um rohingya uh, as a society as a community are very closeted it might not be true with other people who are also refugees and are living a life of refugee in another country. Uh, about this, uh, I, I, I am refraining from using the word community, um, but Rohingya women are not known to be going out of their domestic spaces for work um, in Myanmar. So this is the most uh, important way how they are different because even inside the camps, they are not allowed to, they, they are absolutely not allowed by, often it's quoted by religion uh, because when I spoke with uh, the families on how the women cannot come out and work or even get educated for that matter, often they they quote the the schools and the Molavis uh, and they say that it's uh, banned in the religion. So religion does play a big role here in how this has been pushed down uh, by people. So this is the way it is actually different from other refugee experiences, uh, if at all. Um, also, uh, I, I want to say here that, you know, uh, refu refugeehood liberates. Uh, for even gender, so so whether uh, this this brings on more bondage for a woman or it is actually liberating is uh, is actually a, a question that I have been looking into while looking at the gender aspect in in the camps. Um, so this was okay. I've, uh, okay, so which language is the medium of teaching for the Rohingya children by NGOs? It English is uh, not allowed there, so it is only um, Burmese or uh, Rohingya language. Uh, 
Um, so mostly it is Burmese because English is not allowed. Um, okay, what else? What is? Uh, at what point it started? This kind of. Okay, is this question to me? I'm not sure at what point people start identifying themselves as refugees, diaspora, or migrant diaspora, and how far does this kind of labeling help or hinder their process of development? Okay, so I I really do not think that existing categories that exist in refugee studies studies are really relevant. Uh, the categories need to be questioned absolutely because uh, th there's a conflation of categories. So I kind of question the categories myself. Uh, and at what point they themselves ref uh, recognize is probably when they understand that they have to raise a voice for the Rohingyas, for instance, um, with uh, some of them are educated, the new generation, they could get educated in Myanmar before even coming here, uh, coming in Bangladesh and, for, uh, and to India. So for them, they, they are already aware of their rights also because there has been an like, NGOization of the rights. So with all this education and everything, the awareness programs that are going on in the camps and world over through the accessibility of internet, albeit not existing now. So these are these are moments when uh, when a uh, diasporic community is very different from a refugee, by the way, because a refugee is a person who is persecuted and is fleeing because of force, uh, very different from a diaspora. So, so yeah, these are the moments when when they can know uh, when to protest. Um, okay, so so so. Um, All right, thank you, Sucharita. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, any other can things ask. you want to uh, add, uh, Sucharita? Um, no, it's it's just that I um I couldn't uh, address gender, the role of you know like the question surrounding gender, and also the pandemic situation that I have written actually in Refugee Watch online, but I uh, didn't okay, okay. talk maybe about it. Maybe you, you want to, I mean, you, yeah, maybe. Yeah, briefly you so, want to say, you can say now? Uh, oh, yes. um, it's not, it, it, it's not, uh, I mean, Shamudadi has actually uh, mentioned it already uh, about women. One thing that I wanted to say is that reproductive health is an uh, area of concern in the camps because uh, the NGOs have been organizing awareness campaigns on uh, how, how, like, you know, how to use uh, protective measures, though it hasn't gone down well at all with the men who actually think, you know, like uh, reproduction is uh, God's gift and it shouldn't be controlled, but it has been a growing concern exactly because of the reason that Shamutadi mentioned, there has been growing number of pregnancies uh, forced otherwise. So th this is there. So there are initiatives by the NGOs. Um, and about the pandemic situation, it is um, very much like what we can see in India, nothing exceptionally other, I mean, other than the fact that we can well imagine how it is, I mean, there is a, absolutely no concept of social distancing there. And the worst thing that has been happening is um, because they're out of connection with the outer world for a clampdown on internet. So there is a lot of fake news circulation and rumors. So that has been the most, uh, area like the biggest area of concern in the camps that the people cannot reach out so they they do not even know themselves how many tests are being conducted who has it so there is a you know like a lot of paranoia apart from right. the other reasons like you know social distancing hygiene all these are in any way uh, absolutely non-existent even now so and also uh, they are completely locked down so even uh, whatever help they used to receive before a lockdown is uh, not uh, reachable now to them. So, so th these were like two things, and I can answer questions again. So, right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, so, so Charita. Maybe we uh, yeah, we'll come back to you. Can we now um, uh, go to um, uh, 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 Dr. Biswas? You, I think, have got a question. Uh, if I may uh, read it for you, how travel restrictions and lockdown would impact uh, illegal cross-border migration uh, for any reasons? Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I 
see uh, like i said that i don't think travel restrictions and uh, lockdown would end it forever because given uh, free market and all of these other things we have given the way our economy and our world order has been constructed over the past 20 years we need cross border migration we need people and goods to move from one part of the world to another part of the world so the travel restrictions we have to recognize is new and it is temporary it is probably going to go away and we, we already see that it is going to go away i take issue with this term illegal migration because what is an illegal migration we have to be able to distinguish between people who are refugees refugee becoming a refugee is something that has to be sanctioned by the unhcr the unhcr will determine your refugee status and only then will they you know put you in a third country settlement otherwise yeah. you are stuck somewhere uh, you are trying to make the best you are in a boat you are at the border of uh, greece you're stuck in turkey because you're trying to go to turkey turkey has opened its border greece hasn't so who are you Moreover, and this illegal migrant thing has become such a demon in our popular imagination, but people who are seeking asylum, they have every right to seek asylum. Can we call them illegal migrants? We probably cannot. More And like Parivelan mentioned at the beginning of this session, that there is also these, uh, the states, the nation states have the duty to protect people, not merely its own citizens, although we see that often nation states are not even protecting its own citizens or questioning who are their citizens at all, but also people who have moved, people who have flee, uh, you know, run away from persecution, people who have run away from genocide, from conflict, from armed conflict, from uh, all kinds of exploitation. It is so as humanity, we have responsibility towards these people. So no, I don't think tra uh, travel restrictions or locking our borders is going to solve this in any way. I do think that it will become, it will move more and more underground. As a result, it will become more and more precarious for the people who are trying to get into another country. They will have to give more money to the smugglers and the traffickers. They are probably less likely to reach their destination. They're probably more likely to die. So yes, perhaps in that manner, there, there will be less people moving, but the number of people trying to move will not be any less. Sure. You have one more question on your screen. Uh, can you read it? Uh, yes. Something? Let's see. Okay. As you have mentioned about migrants getting infected in Europe during 2015, and that is the year when who issued uh, best practices for naming new human infectious diseases not by place names but by year do you find any correlation your take on this okay so i was talking about uh, uh, i was merely talking about the study done in 2015 about migrants who were in europe and who were infected by hiv aids so i don't think it is so it's just the year of the study i don't think that is necessarily why who issued uh, best practices for not naming infections about uh, with uh, uh, you know place names however we have seen historically and we saw two months ago by the uh, potus the president of the united states calling the coronavirus the chinese virus we have also seen uh, as a result of which we or, or more similarly we've also seen uh, people who look what people think is chinese being discriminated against uh, and we've also seen uh, an increased persecution of supposed ethnicities for example we have a friend whose uh, husband works in a port and she's convinced that her husband is going to catch plague because of the ships that are coming in from china there is no basis for her to be convinced but she's convinced so we are also in this order in which uh, world order in which information flows very fast but it is impossible to check the information that comes to us. Shutarita talks about uh, misinformation in the Rohingya camps. This is the this is this has been the feedback of people who are working with refugees all over the world. So let's say Karen refugees in the United States, or refugees who are in Indonesia, or even exchange students or foreign students in France. All of them have the same thing to say that they cannot access the information that is being given out in the local languages. As a result, they depend upon informal networks they re depend more on whatsapp forwards and uh, we know that whatsapp forwards might be the single most 
uh, site of increasing prejudice in today's world. So we see what happens when uh, diseases get associated with people and places, ethnicities and communities. All right. Thank you, uh, uh, Samita. Uh, there is one more question which is there. Either one of you can take it. Uh, the question, I'll read it. It says, uh, it reads that how far past events reflect the present in the context of geopolitics? So, Charita, would you like to uh, take it? Or? Um, I mean, in, in terms of refugees uh, and in South Asia, um, Past events, of course, uh, I, I absolutely think that, you know, they have laid the foundation to what we are enduring now, um, not only of, for migrant labor, but otherwise, I mean, the entire geopolitics, entire region, the way the, uh, at least in context of South Asia, the past has definitely uh, kind of, it still haunts, it still comes back because, and it becomes an excuse to haunt. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have to come, but it becomes an excuse, actually. Because if you look at uh, not only Rohingyas, but, you know, there are other... Um, uh, Parivalan had mentioned uh, displacement in Chittagong. So all of these were actually rooted in the 40s, pre-partition time and 50s. So this entire politics of calling the Rohingyas Bengalis in Myanmar. And I have spoken to some people, even human rights activists based in Myanmar, who refuse to recognize them as um, citizens because they were one citizens of Myanmar. They just ref there is a refusal to even acknowledge that they were once members of that uh, country simply because once upon a time they migrated from Chittagong, which was one district pre in the pre-partition time. So and and uh, the borders in Europe, the way they they came into being was very different than how it came into being in South Asia. So that has definitely shaped movements and migration has shaped Asia. So we just cannot question anymore the normalcy of it. So definitely there is a flow right. of events. Yeah, so that will be my submission. Thank you. Uh, I will add something. If you watch our yes. film, the one that we could not stream, Calcutta Migrant City, you will uh, notice how the very space of Calcutta is a result of the geopolitics of the past. And we continue to live in this space, we continue to inhabit in this space, and we continue to perhaps also carry the prejudices of this space on us. And the second submission I would add to this is that uh, Shutarita spoke about South Asia. I will speak about, let's say, uh, America, uh, North America. So the whole uh, fact of the um, United States and Mexico having a border wall between them does not take into account that that was one region. The people living there have historically been one people. So now to carve one people up into two nations and to build a border inside it uh, seems completely forgetting the history of which we are all a product. Yeah, so that's it. All right. Thank you, Samatha. I thank uh, both the uh, panelists, um, uh, Mr. Charita and Dr. Um, uh, Samatha Biswas, for uh, presenting comprehensively in respect to the uh, Rohingya crisis, uh, as well as the uh, pandemic history uh, and how pandemics is, uh, you know, impacting uh, currently. Uh, both had uh, very distinctively contributed to understanding uh, how we are at uh, crossroads and uh, what are the challenges. Uh, as a forced migration, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 a theme or uh, uh, rubric, uh, we are uh, we are facing the challenge and uh, and the opportunity. As I was telling you earlier, I just wanted to you know wrap up this session by uh, telling a, a story of resilience. You know, when we know that general citizens are suffering, uh, the marginalized and vulnerable uh, industry the labor uh, groups are suffering. And uh, you also have a, a situation of, uh, you know, uh, uh, these uh, groups who are asylum seekers or stateless or refugee groups are uh, suffering very enormously. So it actually uh, calls for a need to uh, look at uh, how we will be able to address these issues in the ongoing uh, crisis. I call this as an opportunity as well as uh, a challenge. And uh, uh, we need to look at that. 
I want to just end this session with uh, one story of resilience. When, uh, as I have been interacting with Sri Lankan refugees more closely as part of my research, uh, recently, just during the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I heard, uh, uh, I got, I received a phone call from one of the refugees from the refugee camp, Sri Lankan refugee camp uh, uh, in southern Tamil Nadu. And I'd met him in some forums, and he probably uh, had my number. He called up and said that, how are you uh, during this uh, lockdown and other things? He greeted. I said, fine, we are all coping up with it. How are you doing in the camp? He told that camp life is very difficult. And um, as you know that, you know, they get a small dole from government, and they have to depend extremely on uh, the informal uh, labor sector, uh, such as painting, construction work, domestic work. They have to move around and do. And he told me that now all of them are stopped and, uh, and you know, they, they, they couldn't uh, uh, do anything about it and they're all stranded in camp. But he added further, in spite of the situation, when they saw that, uh, you know, the, the prime minister and chief minister uh, were respectively, you know, uh, receiving funds. I believe uh, even during the tough time, they mobilized uh, about rupees 10,000. And went to the uh, district collector and formally handed over to the chief minister's relief fund for the pandemics. That was something very touching when I heard this. This is the story of resilience. And I asked him, when you are in a tough time, why did you uh, pull money and do? They said that no, um, you know, when India and Tamil Nadu in particular has been hosting us, and when the entire country is undergoing this uh, uh, COVID crisis, and uh, you know, we thought that we should make our own humble contribution. Uh, I call that as a story of resilience that, uh, you know, they, they did, uh, you know, contribute. I'm sure uh, they are doing in, in their own ways other vulnerable groups wherever they are. But it is time for us to uh, make, uh, uh, make it uh, more humane, make it more inclusive, ensuring that uh, no one is left behind, nobody is uh, you know, denied of their uh, rights. I think with this, um, I will uh, formally uh, end this uh, session. And on behalf of the Calcutta Research Group as a member, uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank the Shivnath Sastri College, the principal, uh, the, the faculty, research scholars and students of Department of History and Political Science uh, for organizing this collaborative uh, you know, webinar in a wonderful manner. Since morning till evening, we could see all the participants intact and vibrantly posting questions. I thank uh, on uh, behalf of uh, MCRG, uh, the Shivnath uh, Shastri College, and their entire team who have done a wonderful job of uh, coordinating and uh, conducting this uh, very meaningful, uh, fruitful uh, webinar. Uh, so thanks again. I close it and hand over to the um, organizing team. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you to the esteemed speakers for enlightening and illuminating us with such real facts of the present society. We come to the end of our workshop. The valedictory session will be conducted by Dr. Moshumi Bandopadhyay, faculty of the Department of History, Shivnath Shastri College. Ma'am. Ma'am, you're there. Ma'am, if you're online, please unmute yourself. And uh, before the valedictory sessions begin, uh, let me I need to tell something to the participants regarding the feedback link. Everything will be explained to you all after the session ends. It will be done by Professor Aritra Mojumdar. Please be patient. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Sreya. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to sum up the day's proceedings in the concluding session of one day international workshop on forced migration, humanity at the crossroads, organized by the departments of history and political science, Shivanath Shastri College, in collaboration with Mohanirban Calcutta Research Group. The global pandemic in the form of COVID-19 has resulted in an unprecedented disaster in human lives across the whole planet. In fact, all our normal practices and social norms have taken a hit, and we are constantly brainstorming on how to do things differently, virtually without contact, social distancing, and so on. But the entire episode has taken a heavy toll on one of the most vulnerable sections of the society, 
the migrant workers. While some have been more hit by COVID-19 and some are trifle less, the bottom line is that absolute apathy towards the migrant workers have been thoroughly exposed. The issues of mobility and migration will continue in a post-COVID world, and the crisis would leave behind its long tail of imprints. The economic compulsions for the migrants to earn their livelihood would persist. In order to make both ends meet, both their job search and migration would continue. However, many questions would still remain unanswered. How will financial stability, commodity prices, or remittances affect lower income countries? What implications will it have on the potential migrants and migration opportunities? How quickly would the migrant hubs recover? And in which sectors will workers be required? How hard will remittance reliant households be hit? And what can be done to cushion effects? How do social relations and access to healthcare shape migration decisions in times of pandemics and beyond? And how human will our approach to refugees be? Many decisions taken today will have long-standing implications. We may see more caution and hesitation in the future concerning openness, mobility, and migration. At the same time, we will have recognized how essential migration and mobility is for exchange, wealth, and opportunities. It was the media that brought to our notice the plight of the hapless migrant workers. But our speakers for the day enriched us with the deliberations on the different aspects of migration. The overwhelming response from the participants from Royal Holloway, Warwick in UK, UK Dhaka University, Bangladesh, Nigeria, and South Africa is by itself a testimony to the fact that how the entire academic circle and beyond have been moved and unsettled by the plight of the migrants. I have full faith that the knowledge gathered by all of us in this workshop would lead to further introspection and movement against forced migration. I take this opportunity for thanking Dr. Runa Vishash, our principal, for inspiring us to do this workshop. I would also like to offer my heartfelt thanks to Mohanidban Calcutta Research Group, especially Dr. Shamulindu Mojumdar, for the magnanimous decision to collaborate with us in organizing this workshop. I would like to extend my gratitude and heartfelt thanks to the distinguished speakers who set the tone for provoking thoughts. I would like to thank Dr. Paula Banerjee, who started the workshop with a very insightful keynote address and moderated the first session. My thanks to Dr. Shomir Kumar Dash, who analyzed the problems and plight of the displaced against the backdrop of the recent pandemic. My thanks to Dr. Shomita Shain, who delivered a very interesting lecture on reverse migration with an altogether different perspective. I am grateful to Shanjoy Barbora for enlightening us on the issues related to community, governance, and labor in the Northeast. My sincere thanks goes out to the moderator of the second session, Dr. Dr. Parivelan, who discussed about refugees across the world and moderated the session very aptly. I would like to thank Dr. Shuchorita Shengupto, who illuminated us about the refugees and their crisis in the post-Second World War era, with special emphasis on the Rohingyas. And finally, I would like to thank Dr. Shamota Bishash for speaking at length on the pandemic and its impact on immigrants in USA with a historical backdrop. Migrant workers associated with essential services across the world have continued serving amidst the epidemic in subhuman condition. All their captivating deliberations kept us spellbound. I'd like to thank all the faculty members of the history and political science departments for their seamless execution of plans. Last but not the least, I must acknowledge the stellar contribution of the organizing committee comprising Srimati Sreya Chatterjee, Srimitun Dash, and Srimitun Pal, led by the organizing secretary, Sri Aurithro Mojumdar, who 
tirelessly manned the control room in addition to carrying out the entire organizing process. Thank you. Now I would like to uh, call upon Sri Aurithra Mujunda to apprise you about the feedback procedure and obtaining of these certificates for participation. Over to Aurit. Well, thank you, Dr. Moshri Mujumdar, for that very well put and very pertinent vote of thanks. I would, uh, before I move into the question of feedback link, I think two apologies are in order on the part of the organizers. Firstly, I would personally like to apologize to uh, Dr. Shuchadita Shengupta for the delay in the uh, shift, uh, shifting or the transition of the slides. I had some network issues at that very moment, and I apologize for that. Uh, the second apology goes out to the YouTube uh, viewers who could not watch the uh, short film directly. I hope that they will be able to view the short film through the YouTube link that was sent via email and also posted in the chat box. Um, with that out of the way, I would like to uh, move into the very um, you know, burning question of generation of the certificate and feedback link, because I've been getting a lot of queries uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, firstly uh, and foremost, I would like to mention that there will be no pasting of any feedback link or any certificate link, either in Google Meet or in the YouTube live stream. This is because we do not want the links to be forwarded. They are specific to 100 participants each. So if you are not part of that 100 participant in which uh, you know, to that link which you have been sent, uh, then perhaps if you fill it up, then the others might have a problem. So I hope that everyone understands that we cannot share these links uh, on the open forum. Uh, now, I would like to draw the attention of all the participants to the question of uh, how to uh, fill up the feedback link and generate the certificates. So if you would kindly pin my, my screen, I will show you how to do that. Uh, Sreyadi, am I visible? Is my uh, presentation visible? Yes, you are visible. Thank you. Um, all right, so let me just put this in full screen. Is the presentation visible, Sreyadi? Yes, it is visible. Yes, yes. Great. All right. Um, so there are two categories of uh, participants. The vast majority of participants have joined via Gmail. And the process for obtaining the certificate is very simple for those who have Gmail address. Uh, first of all, please make sure that you have logged in into your Gmail address, whether it is the Gmail address uh, to which you registered or it is a different Gmail address does not matter. The email with which you resist registered will be the one on which you receive the uh, feedback link, but you can fill it up using a different email address. We do not mind that. Um, so open the Gmail uh, with which you registered and uh, then open the feedback link. You will see that the feedback link has this format which is given here. Set X, one day workshop on forced migration humanity at the crossroads. X stands for the set number. So there are seven sets, one to seven. So you will get one of these seven sets. You will not get more than one set. So please fill up the set you get. Do not ask for other sets because other sets do not have your name in them. So log into the Google form using your Gmail address. Enter your Gmail address in the email address form. Uh, fill up your details. Choose your registration email address from the drop down menu. So this may be a different email address. It might be the same email address that is as per your decision, the decision you took at the time of registration. Uh, and fill up the feedback and suggestions. Please solicit your suggestions. And when you're giving the suggestions, please make sure that uh, you do not post any link in the suggestions because it will not accept it. It's a Google uh, form limitation. Uh, so give your suggestions, click submit, and then, very importantly, you must check your Gmail, which you entered in the first box. 
So here I mentioned that uh, log in to your, with your Gmail address and enter your Gmail address in the Gmail, in the email address form. So please check the email you entered here. There will be a email like this one. I hope it is visible to all of you. Uh, it will be certificate for, for your name, whatever name it is, uh, for one day workshop. It will be a PDF file shared to your Google Drive. So you can open it from here directly. You, it will open your Google Drive and you can find your certificate. There might be a little delay due to network congestion, but we assure you that if you have a Gmail address and there is nothing wrong with the syntax or the uh, structure of the address, then you should receive your uh, certificate within a few hours, at most within one day. Uh, if you cannot find this uh, mail, please check your spam or your promotion folder. So you can save it in your Google Drive. You can send it to uh, any other email address. That is your choice. That certificate is yours uh, forever. And uh, I think somebody is writing that. Please explain it again. Um, it's very simple, actually. Enter uh, the in, enter the email which you chose at the time of registration. Check for a feedback link. Fill up the feedback link. Fill up the feedback form using a Gmail address. Check that Gmail address after you fill up that form. You should get this sort of email with the certificate. This is as simple as it, as it is. Uh, it should not take much time. For those with non-Gmail addresses, the process is a bit more complicated. I say complicated because there are some limitations imposed by Google and it, we can do nothing about it. Um, those who have non-Gmail addresses will receive two sets. One set will be within, between one to six and that can be filled up only using Gmail address. So if you registered using Yahoo or your institutional email address, and you have a Gmail address available, then you open your institutional or email, Yahoo or any other email address with which you register, open that link from there and log in with your Gmail address. And then you will receive the certificate in your Gmail address. However, if you do not have a Gmail address at all and you must use a non-Gmail address, then you must fill up only one form that is set seven. Everyone who has registered with a non-Gmail address has been included in set seven, as well as some people in the T to Z category, that is those whose names start with T to Z. So T to Z plus non-Gmail addresses are included in, in set seven only. If you get set seven, please fill up set seven only. After you fill up set seven, you will not get a Google Drive share, uh, shared email, you will get a direct attachment. However, due to the limitations we mentioned, the delay might be there in the sending of this email. It might take up to 48 hours or two days for the email to re re reach your non-Gmail address. So we would again urge all of you, all the participants who have patiently listened to us for this long to use a Gmail address and use a non-Gmail address only and only if no Gmail address is possible. So I hope this is very clear. Uh, I think many of you are writing that you have not received any email. That is perfectly obvious because we have not sent any email yet. We first wanted to explain the whole process and streamline the whole thing. Once this workshop is over, which it will soon be, we will start sending out the different sets, set one to set seven. And when you receive that email, it will not be from MailChimp, it will be directly from one of the organizers. So I request you to be patient. I request you to keep checking your email every uh, half an hour or so. Whenever you get the form, whenever you get the link to the form, you can take as much time as you like. We will keep the form open throughout today and possibly sometime into tomorrow as well. So please don't worry about uh, the form being closed. Please don't worry about any delay. All of you will get your certificate just by following the procedure we have explained in the previous slides. And as mentioned multiple times, no attendance and feedback form will link, will be shared via WhatsApp, Google Meet chat, live stream chat box, et cetera, et cetera. 
this is for the reasons we have explained previously so i hope it is clear and if any query is there then please uh, send a mail to one of the organizers i hope that the organizers emails are already there because we send multiple emails to you in the course of the previous two weeks uh, if there are any queries please ask us but please be patient please take some time before you uh, start saying that you have not received the uh, link or you have not received the certificate um, i think really this is uh, all i wanted to say um, should we wrap it up yes we can precisely uh, some one has pointed out in the chat box that your voice was not clear somebody has pinged that the youtube in the youtube the slides were not clear so it precisely nothing we will be mailing the feedback form attendance form to each of the participants email address after we email it you please to fill it up and accordingly you will receive the e certificates this is a very simple version we will not post it in the chat box of any of the live stream or in gmail if you have still further any clarifications you can contact us personally we will clear it out thank you all with this we come to the end thank you everyone i think as lady pointed out we are shobai ke ekbar ami arekbar bole dicchi बुझते कसुविधाई फ्यूचर Uh, yes uh, uh, anam fatima requested yes yes, so yes we we'll try, try to arrange a workshop like this in the future as well thank you very much for your the encouragement we thank all of you for the staying with us for this long and hope this has been a enriching experience uh with this i think we can you now yes. call, can call the close of this you can end it thank you hmm.